Hey, it's Andre from the High Performance Academy and we're here with Stefan Papadakis from Papadakis Racing and we've got Frederick Aspo's Scion TC Formula GIF competition car here. Now Stefan's been nice enough to offer to give us a, a bit of a technical tour over what makes Frederick's car tick. So look, this is a, a pretty serious car. Obviously all of the cars, Stefan, that are running in Formula GIF these days are, are fairly heavily modified compared to anything you'd buy off the showroom floor. Let's talk a little bit for a start about the conversion from front wheel drive to rear wheel drive. How, how, did, how much involved with chassis modification was there there? Sure, well first of all Formula D, Formula Drift, this, the series, has very strict rules on what we can and can't modify. So it's a very factory based chassis. So they allow us to cut a certain amount of inches away from the firewall and from the floor just for fitting the, the bell housing and the transmission. So we do that, we build a new little area of the firewall yep. and a tunnel yep. uh, and custom engine mounts and we have to notch the uh, front cross member a little bit. It looks like it's going to make it a lot easier to work on though with the, the way the engine bay is laid out. Is it pretty easy to get, a, get an engine in and out? It is. Well, so the front wheel drive cars have pretty wide frame rails because the engine usually is, you know, across the, the, across the engine bay. So when you go in, uh, to a longitudinal setup like what we have, uh, it's, it's very wide on either side, easy to work on. Is there anything you have to do when you're building these chassis that you, you're sort of keeping in mind to make them easier to repair? Let's be honest, they spend a lot of time rubbing the guardrails these days. Sure. Um, we cut everything off that Formula Drift lets us cut off. <laughs> so we, we, can, we can't modify anything inside of the front and rear suspension points. So if you look at the car, you'll see right where the front suspension points are, it's basically the front chassis has been cut off and we have like a tube chassis up there. And that makes it so the car's a little bit more robust if it does run into something, and uh, it's easier for us to fix. It doesn't have to go to a body shop. We can just build some new tubes at, at the shop or even bring spares with us to the track. Yeah, it sounds like that'll make it a lot easier to work on. Now that engine, you, you said that uh, you're making somewhere sort of around seven, seven to eight hundred horsepower. You're running a large turbo and, and a shot of nitrous. Uh, tell us what you had to do to that engine to keep it reliable and hold it together at that sort of power level. Sure. Um, the two AR engine is actually quite strong from the factory as far as the bottom end. We use the two point seven liter crank out of a one AR, uh, and that's been reground for a little bit different, like traditional rod bearing, sure. a two-inch rod bearing. We use a, a forged rod and a JE piston and actually a stock sleeve. Um, to, we had to keep the head on, uh, we upsized to an inch 13, or a, sorry, half inch head stud. Uh, so it's a large diameter head stud and a factory head gasket. It's a very good three layer stainless and it's got the one layer where it adds like three thousandths more seal just around the top of the cylinders. It's pretty common on a lot of the new cars. Uh, the big weak point in the engine is the valve train. So above 6,500 RPM, uh, the hydraulic lifter and uh, there's little lash caps are on top of each one of the valves. The hydraulic, la la the hydraulic lifters fail and rocker armors fall off and lash caps fall off and it creates mayhem. So we actually use a racing valve train that's a solid lifter and it, we upsize instead of the 5.5 millimeter valve, we run a 6 millimeter valve and a racing uh, roller rocker that cups the valve a lot more. So even if there is some float, the rocker doesn't want to actually fall off. Is the stuff you've done with the valve train all in-house that you've developed or are the off-the-shelf parts available for these engines now? They're semi-custom. What's pretty uh, good for us is the GM Ecotech engine that they drag raced for years has a really, really similar valve train. Uh, so we actually are able to use the, the rocker arms and the solid lifters that they originally developed for those Ecotech race engines. And we do a custom uh, Supertech valve and uh, spring kit for our engine. And we end up with a really reliable system. Great that you got to the bottom of the problem. Now you mentioned that you were using a 2.7 litre crankshaft that was offset ground. What's the actual capacity of the finished engine? It's 2.7 liters. We use the factory bore size because uh, we want to keep as thick of a cylinder wall as possible. And uh, I think it's, oh, don't quote me on this, I think it's a 106 millimeter stroke maybe. Okay, so as for getting some boost into the engine, what are you running there for a turbocharger? We're running the EFR from Borg Warner. Uh, it's an 8374 turbocharger. 
and it's all ball bearing and I mean, this thing's been super reliable. We run these for three years and never have failures. We send them back every six months, so the engineers at, at Borg Warner can look at them and see what kind of, uh, you know, wear they have, and they're like, ah, we just put it right back together and send it back. So we've been extremely happy with the Borg Warner product. Perfect. I did notice with the EFR series, they've got an option for an internal wastegate, and you've got two external wastegates on this particular car. Is there a reason why you've gone that way? Yeah, so initially we started with the internal gate because it was much simpler, uh, but sometimes we'll run a very wide range and boost. Low of 12 PSI and very high of 30. The internal gate is not able to get us both of those. If we try to put a, a gate on there that can do as low as 12 PSI, when we try to turn it up to 30 PSI, the back pressure actually opens up the valve. So we went to the twin uh, wastegate setup because it's the tangential exhaust housing, which means it has two routes into the exhaust housing. So we have a wastegate for each one of those routes, and now we can have dead nuts uh, regulation wherever we want. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so as for the rest of the engine, what about the fuel system and the nitrous system? Can you tell us how that works? Sure. We run on E85 fuel, um, so it's mostly ethanol, and we run two Bosch 044 pumps in the tank. Uh, that goes to a dash eight fuel line up to the front, and uh, just four uh, Injector Dynamics 2000 cc injectors. And through those injectors, uh, the, infinity, the AEM Infinity controls not only the fuel that we normally run on the Turbo Boost, but also the fuel for the nitrous. So when the nitrous is active, the direct port nitrous system uh, shoots nitrous into the four cylinder ports, and the additional fuel for that comes through our normal four injectors controlled you know, by the Infinity. So it's a dry, dry system and you're using the Infinity to supply the additional fuel. Exactly, and, and that way it's always consistent um, and we monitor the fuel pressures and everything and make sure that we always have enough fuel pump and once we get past that initial development phase then it's solid after that. Okay, let's talk about the electronics package in the car. You've got the AEM ECU, I notice you've also got a dash in there. Are you doing data logging through the dash? Uh, nope, the AIM dash we have is just for display. Uh, the AEM Infinity, we do most of the data log because mostly what we're looking at is uh, the engine parameters and they're already going to the Infinity. We also have the AEM AQ1, which is like a chassis data logger. Uh, and when we do suspension testing, we'll have linear sensors on the, the shocks and uh, we'll run those into the AQ1. But we don't use that most of the time during the weekends. That'll just be some initial testing or if we're doing component design. I'm guessing you've got enough on your plate with a, a competition weekend than worrying about shock travel sensors. Yeah, you know, it's this, this drifting is so much about the driver and it's so much about uh, these guys just really being in tune and driving really well. Um, we just need to give the drivers a really good solid car. That's their tool. And then they go out there and, and put on that show and, and do a really good job in competition. All right, before we finish up, I just want to talk a little bit about the drivetrain. So, I mean, the engine's making a lot of power. I've seen how these guys drive. They're absolute animals. So how do you hold a drivetrain together on, on this sort of car? What sort of clutch and gearbox are you running? Sure. So ACT uh, builds us a custom triple disc clutch, uh, and that's the one that we run. Um, the transmission is actually a NASCAR spec G-Force uh, racing. They call it a GSR transmission. So it's a four-speed. It's a dog box, straight cut gears and uh, the ratios are pretty straightforward. We mostly do our tuning with uh, the rear end gear ratios depending on track uh, layouts. So tell us, tell us how you go about choosing your, your rear end ratio from your, your data from the track. Sure, so we want to make sure that Frederick can stay pretty much floored in, in the high speed parts of the track. And if we see that the car is sitting on the rev limiter a lot, we'll usually put a little bit longer gear in the car or uh, if he's having trouble getting it up to the RPM that he needs and maybe he's part of the slower part of the track, then we'll put a little bit more ratio in it. And do you have to change the whole rear, rear end or are you just changing the ratio? We change the whole rear end. The rear ends that we use are actually out of a, 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 like a 94 Toyota Supra, a JZ80. So we have several rear ends with a couple different ratios. Normally we run a 4.27 ratio, but we also put in the, the 3.7 sometimes. I'm guessing with the tube frame rear end and all the modifications, those sort of changes are pretty quick at the track anyway? Yeah, the guys will get it changed in 35 minutes or so. 
Um, it's usually pretty hot when they do it, but it, it's relatively quick. Yeah. Hey, look, thank you very much for taking the time to show us around the car. It's an awesome work of art. The engineering is second to none. Now, Frederick came fourth in the championship this year. He's got a bit of a bit of time in the off season. Hope you guys uh, do really well next year, and all the best. Thank you very much. For online tuning courses, visit learntotune.com.